Um, I don't know, is it still morning or I don't know. <laughs> However, good morning, people, good people. I want to say this before um, I say everything, that somebody was teasing me that um, in Africa we don't have wristwatches and Dr. Mesna bought one for me and I've even forgotten it because I'm not used. <laughs> but even though we don't have wristwatches, we have all the time. When in the US, people have wristwatches, but they don't have time. <laughs> so uh, uh, one of the things I'm supposed to be careful with is not to waste people's time, because people don't have time. <laughs> My name is Blessings Chikagula, just as uh, Dr. Mezna has said. And um, I am a teacher. I teach at uh, a girls' secondary school back in Malawi. Um, I come from a family of four, and I'm the last born, and I am the only one who went to school. Uh, growing up was not uh, an easy thing there, um, but then uh, uh, after hard work, I managed to uh, finish my high school education. Immediately after finishing, my father died. And in 1994, uh, with the change of government, there was a big vacancy for teachers uh, since the president was uh, uh, decreed for free primary education. So I began as a temporary teacher in 1994 and then 1997 went to college and graduated in 1999. And as I, as I was working as a primary school teacher, I was not satisfied, I wanted to upgrade myself, and that's how I ended up uh, being at African Bible College owned by American people from Jackson, Mississippi. And um, in 2006, upon graduation, the African Bible College people uh, recommended and requested me to work at their school, ABC Christian Academy, and that's how I met William in 2007. Uh, Mr. Chagwusson was then the headmaster, and he requested me to be helping William, tutoring him in uh, um, African history, as, as well as English, spelling, and all those things. And we finally became friends. And, um, and things went beyond friendship. Uh, as, uh, as he was trying to write his book, William recommended me that I could help Brian Miller and himself to write the book. So we, we began this project. After we finished this project, we went into the... Uh, uh, a documentary movie that has just been released, I think, a couple of weeks or maybe last month. Um, and so that's how I, I knew William. But in the course of our stay, William and I, I have had several visitors coming to William's village. Even when William was in school in South Africa, as well as here, uh, I have had so many people. Uh, but it took people from Appalachian State University uh, to talk about issues and finally make my dream of visiting the U.S. come uh, come true. And so I want to say this without wasting much time, that I'm so grateful to Mr. Jesse Pipes, uh, Dr. Mat Martin Mesner, uh, Meredith Church, and all these people that have made it possible for me to come here. I want you to know that it's not easy for me to come all the way from Malawi to here. It was my first time flying this longer distance. Um, and my village was very happy. Dr. Mezna mentioned that the whole village was at the airport to see me off. It is simply because they were overexcited and they didn't believe it. Uh, uh, uh. 
but, but that I'm here, it's an honor, and I would like to uh, extend the greetings that the people uh, of my village are sending, and I want to say thank you so much. On Monday, I'm very excited because I want to uh, see the admissions office people uh, to see if I can get admitted into this uh, university. After saying all this, I have the humble um, privilege to introduce to us uh, the guest speaker of this conference, my good friend, um, ma, who, who we have always been waiting for, William Kankwamba, uh, to come on stage. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much. It's real, uh, it's real great honor for me this morning to be here. Uh, thank you for allowing me to share my story with you. As you have already heard from uh, blessings, my name is William Kankwamba. Um, I'm from Malawi. So just a little bit of Malawi. I think you have heard a lot, but... Some of you have been to Malawi, but some haven't been to Malawi. So those who haven't been to Malawi, um, just, I just want to show you where Malawi exactly is. Malawi is in southern Africa, um, bordered by Mozambique, Zambia, Tanzania. So geographically, that's where Malawi is. I grown up in the small village um, in Malawi, in central Malawi. I grown up in the family of seven children, all sisters, excepting me. So you can imagine, life wasn't too easy for me. <laughs> Especially at school, sometimes I'll go there, and the other boys, if I have banana, they'll be like, give us your banana, I'll be like, it's mine though. They'll be, no, give us. So most of the time, I'll just like, give them. I guess I was too stubborn. Instead of telling my elder sisters, my older sister, that these boys are bothering me, I wasn't doing that. I was just like, I think I'll deal with it by myself. Anyway, I survived from, I survived from, from them. So, as I was growing up, my, my parents are farmers, so everyone would depend on, like, we grow lots of uh, corn, we grow soya beans, sweet potato. That's pretty much everyone does in the, in the area that I came from. Farming can be very easy and it can also be challenging. There are a number of things that makes farming a little difficult. One of which is weather or price of seeds or price of fertilizer. Because most of the farmers in my community, they depend on applying fertilizer because they the soil, it has been depleted and there's not much nutrients in the soil so that when you grow, you can harvest a lot of crops. So you need to apply fertilizer. So if the price of fertilizer goes up and you don't have money to buy it, then in that particular year, as a farmer, you're going to be really in trouble. Or if the price of seeds goes up and you don't have proper seeds to plant, you can also be in danger. So most of the time, farmers will look up into these three things, hoping that everything will be all right. So in 2001, we experienced some drought. At the results, lots of farmers, they didn't harvest enough crops. Most of them, they only harvested quarter amount of what they were hoping to harvest. So you can imagine that many of those farmers, they depend on, they depend on the crops that they, that they grow to eat for the entire year. So only harvesting quarter of it, it was really hard for them to adjust their, 
um, adjust their, their eating up so that the amount of food that they had could sustain them until the next harvesting season. Even my family was badly affected by the situation. Because of that situation, my parents at that time couldn't have like enough money to buy, um, to buy food that we, are, we would be eating. Our main food, we call it in Sima, it's made out of corn flour. You can eat with vegetable or chicken or beef if you have money. So, because of the situation, a lot of people ran out of food and there were famine in the country going on at that time. The corn that they were selling at the market was coming from like our neighboring country, Tanzania. So to transport that corn was so expensive and some vendors who were selling the corn, they took advantage of the situation. They end up tripling the price which made it real difficult to people in the villages who didn't have enough money to buy it. I remember my family, when they found out that we remained with one bag of corn, they decided to grind it and to start business. My mom, st my mom started making cakes out of corn flour. She was selling the cakes at the market, and the profit that she was getting she was buying more food so that we can, they can sustain us until the next harvesting season. But the problem was that the price of corn at the market continues to increase, which was real difficult for them, for the profit that they were making, to sustain us. So it was during the same time that I, that I was supposed to start a high school. High school in Malawi, you have to pay for it, while primary schools are for free. Because of the situation, I was forced to drop out of school because my parents couldn't afford to pay for it. When I had to drop out of school, I looked at my father and looking those dry fields, it was the future I couldn't accept. I didn't want to become like him. I didn't want to become a farmer. It's not that I didn't want to become a farmer because I hate farming. No. I love farming. But I didn't want to live the life, my life to be determined by the situation that I'm in, which is the case for many people in my community. I want to live the life that I can be able to do anything that I want to do at any time without being limited by, uh, by education. So, for me, to get out of that cycle was through education. But there was only one way for me to continue with my, my studies. I decided to start reading books at the library. Like enough, the year before I graduated from my primary school, they introduced the library which was a small library. They had at least less than 500 books. They were more of like textbooks. I thought that if I can be going to the library, reading books, then I'll keep up with my studies. With my friends who were going to school at that time, I was hoping that if I'll be able to keep up with my studies, by the time the hunger, the hunger will be over, my parents will send me back to school, so I shouldn't be very behind from anyone else. So at that time, I started going to the library. I started reading books, um, science books. Some of the books that I was reading, they were much higher level books than the level that I was. And the, I used some diagrams to read the words around them. Even that time, I couldn't read English that well. So by looking at the diagrams and trying to understand what is going on, uh, learning the words around them, I was able to learn and understand how electromagnetics work and being able to 
being able to, to understand it. One thing that made me get really interested in science is that when I was much younger, some of my friends were introduced to movies. So they will come back to school, they will be telling me that last night we watched, the, uh, we watched this movie and we were seeing people were doing so many actions, jumping up and down. So for me, I'll be just like asking myself, how is it possible that you can see an image of a person uh, in a piece of grass just like jumping up and down? How is that possible? I couldn't get the idea around it. So most of the time, I'll try to get understanding what is happening. I remember at some point asking, my friend, asking some people, how does the car work? They say, oh, you just put in a gas and then you start the engine. I'll be, yeah, I know that you need to put in a gas, but how does that gas turn the car into learning? No one will tell me. So by seeing these books, I thought that I'll be able to get some, some answers and some understanding what is happening. I remember, I also remember one time when I was young, I thought that inside the radio, there are small, tiny peeps, people who speak. <laughs> one day, my parents went away. I was like, this is the time for me to say hi to the people. <laughs> so I took the radio, I opened it. I was so surprised to see something that looks like beans, very small, tiny things. I was like, are uh, these people? <laughs> Being a kid, I was like, it's easy to tell if they are people. I was like, I'm just going to twist one of it a little hard. If it will feel pain, it will be screaming like, leave us alone. <laughs> I did that, nothing happened. So from there, I started like, I started lim removing one component after another, listening to what is happening to the radio. And uh, I was able to learn how to fix radio. When I remove one component, the, quali uh, the quality of the sound would drop, and I'll know that this component is something to do with the quality of the sound. If I remove another component, I'll sound that this, the volume will reduce. I'll be like, OK, this guy is to do with the volume. So from there, I was able to learn how to fix radios and um, things like that. So, one day, when I went to the library, I found this book called uh, Use, Using Energy. It had the pictures of the windmill on the cover. And when I opened inside, they say, windmills could pump water and generate electricity. The word pump water attracted my attention. I say, what can I do with the windmill that can be able to pump water? I said that. If I can be able to build this windmill to pump water, I can be able to study irrigation, growing food two to three times a year instead of only one time during the rain season. So for me, the windmill was answer towards the, towards the problem that we are facing. I was like, if I can be able to build it, then I can be able to triple the amount of food that we grow per year. So, I decided to build a windmill uh, by myself. But at the same time, I didn't have money to buy them materials to build my windmill. So what I ended up doing, I ended up going to the junkyard, which was just next to the, next to the high school that I've just dropped from. So I was going there to correct all the pieces that I needed for my windmill. When I was doing all this, a lot of people were laughing at me. They thought that maybe I was going crazy. My mom, she was also worried, and some people were saying that maybe I'm smoking weed. <laughs> Regardless of what, I was, what people were saying, I didn't stop going there. I remember my mom saying that, you are no longer going to find a wife because, because no one wants to marry a crazy man. I understand why they were saying all this kind of stuff, because at that time, when I was collecting all this junk, I was putting them in my room. And at some point, my room itself started looking like a junk. So 
they had no idea what Winmi was. So they were like, this guy is saying that he's building something that we don't know, but at the same time, he's collecting all this junk. I think something is wrong with him. So at the junkyard, I was able to find a shock absorber that I used as a shaft of my windmill. I also find uh, a tractor fan I used as a load of my windmill. When I was able to collect all this stuff, I was able to build my, my windmill. So when I finishing, when I finished build this windmill, I didn't stop um, going to the li library. I continued going there. And at first, when my windmill started working, I was able to use to power a light bulb so that I can be able to, to study later on at night. And I was also able to uh, charge um, to power radio to be able to listen to it. And a lot of people were also like coming to see what I've done. For me, in order to make my, my windmill work quite well, I also had to make some uh, adjustment. I had to make my own switch because I didn't have money to buy it and also my own circuit breaker. I was afraid that if the wire cross together, they can start, it can bend my, my house. So I had to build my circuit breaker, which I made out of um, nails and wires and then some magnets. All this design, I was copying some ideas that I was just finding some diagrams in the book. Um, I took the diagram that I saw, the electric bell diagram, that's I just changed the, the system instead of being like electric bell to be a circuit breaker. So a lot of people were coming up to see what I've done. I remember people coming asking me, what is this machine? I'll tell them, uh, this is windmill which generate power. And they were asking me, what can you do with the power that you're going to be able to generate in this windmill? I'll tell them that you're going to be able to charge a cell phone. And some of them, they had cell phones. They'll be, can we try to charge a cell phone to, to prove if this, it can charge a cell phone? I'll be, yeah, of course. So we plug in a cell phone, and it will be showing that it is charging. I'll say, like, your cell phone is charging, so you, you believe me that it can be able to charge a cell phone. Can you take a, your cell phone now? They'll be like, no, 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 no. We won't believe you. We'll believe you when our cell phone will be fully charged. <laughs> so... I guess most of them, they just wanted their cell phone to get charged. <laughs> anyway, so when I did this, I continued going to the library. And one day, when I went to the library, the librarian asked me, why do you always check out the same book? I explained to her that the book helped me to build a windmill that generated electricity. In my, in my village. And she was so interested to come and see what I have done. She came, she went back, and a few, week, a few weeks later, the people who donate the book in the libraries, uh, different libraries in Malawi, were visiting all the libraries. And uh, they end up like vis visiting my, um, the library that I was using. And she told them what I have done, and they were also interested. They came to see and they went back. They came again, but this time they came with uh, some journalists. One of the journalists wrote an article about my story. That article was picked up by one of my friends in Longwe, and that friend, he took that article, he showed to his boss, and his boss put it in his blog, and that blog was seen by one of the guys who was organizing the TED conference which was held in Arusha, Tanzania. So I was invited to attend the conference in Tanzania. But for him to find me, it was so difficult because he had to call, he had to call the guy who brought the journalist to my village, and the guy who brought the journalist to my village called my cousin, and my cousin called my other cousin, my other cousin called my other cousin. <laughs> Finally, the other cousin told me. <laughs> I was so 
excited and also worried at the same time because I've never been away from my village. So when I heard the news that I'll be going to the conference, I was like, how am I going to dress up to the conference? How the experience will be? Um, where am I going to be staying? But the most interesting thing is that they told me that I've been, I'll be like flying to the conference. I've, ne I've never seen an airplane before. Like enough, uh, people in my village, they told me, they're like, son, we heard that you are going to this trip. Make sure that the night before you are fried, make sure that you don't eat. I was like, why? They say, if you eat, you're going to vomit in the plane. <laughs> so that night, I didn't eat. When I get in the plane, I was so surprised that they were giving us food. <laughs> I, I was almost like refusing, like, if you want to embarrass me, no, the people in my village have already told me that <laughs> I'm going to vomit. So I guess people didn't know. They were just like, they were just talking things that they didn't know. So anyway, so when I was at the conference, I spoke very briefly, and a lot of people came up to me. They asked me, how can we help you? I said, I want to continue with my work building more windmills, especially a windmill that can pump water uh, for irrigation, and also I want to continue with my studies. As my original idea, when I started like, planning to build this windmill, was to build a windmill that generate power, not to build a windmill for, um, for, for, um, for power. I was planning to build a windmill that pumps water, but I ended up building the windmill that generates power because at that time, I couldn't find money to buy a water pump or to buy a materials that I would have used for water pump. So that's why I ended up building the windmill to generate electricity also because when I learned how to fix radios, most of the time I was using batteries to fix radios, which were expensive for me to buy. Most of the time I'll go out uh, looking for used up batteries that people have thrown them away. And I'll connect. If I'm fixing a radio that uses two batteries, I'll take at least eight batteries, putting them together, just so I can get a small, like a remaining juice in each battery can add up to be enough to charge, um, to power, uh, to battery radio. So, because I had some ideas on how electricity can be generated, that's why I ended up building the windmill that was able to uh, generate power. So, when I went back home from the conference, when people, um, after people were able like, to help me, I was able to build the, this windmill which was pumping water for my mom's vegetable garden, some of the vegetables she was selling, some were eating. So that's one thing that I did. And I, also, I was also able to go back to school. Um, I first went to, the, uh, to ABC, um, African Bible College Christian Academy. And uh, after there, I went to the African Leadership Academy where I finished up my my high school. The African Leadership Academy is a new high school. My class was the first class to graduate. The founder of this school was also at the conference and he spoke about the school and he told me that when he will start receiving the application, he will send me the email so that I can apply. But at that time, I had no idea what was the, uh, the email was because I didn't have the email address and like enough, one of my friends helped me to open up email address and to tell me all stuff about the internet. I remember one thing that I did when somebody showed me the internet was to Google windmills. I was so surprised to see so many results about windmills, so many pictures. I was like, if I had this internet when I was doing my windmill, my life could have been much easier. So anyway, so when they started receiving the application, he sent me the email, and I was able to apply, and I got in. 
So I went there for two years. Um, one thing that I did at the conference that um, other people helped me to start was to start the organization called Moving Windmills. That organization we were trying to improve uh, rural uh, economic development in rural areas in Malawi. And we are also working on trying to improve education system in Malawi. One of the things that we are doing, we are rebuilding the primary school that I went to. The school was built almost 60 years ago with the capacity of 400 students. By the time we are going there, we are 2,000 students. Right now, there are 1,400 students. So the classes, they are not in good shape. And also, the classes, they are not enough. Most of the time, students will learn under the tree. So we are trying to rebuild it so that the students, they can have um, good classrooms to learn. So far, we have been able to build three classroom blocks, which has two classes each. So we have like six new classrooms. We are planning to build more. And the, when you do this, all this building of the school, uh, we are also like, after building the school, I was able to install solar panels and the, I was also able to build the windmill. We are planning that if they can be able to have electricity at the school, then they can be able to study later on at night. One other thing that we are using is that later on at night, the parents sometimes they came in to learn about uh, home economic uh, management, uh, stuff like that, and also learning how uh, to farm. So the other thing, when I was building the windmill, I wasn't just like building it by myself, but I was also doing it with some, some student from the school. The idea is that if I can teach other people how to do it, then they can be able to do for themselves or they can be able to do for other people uh, when I'm not there. So we are able to build this windmill uh, which uh, generate power together with the solar panels to power the, the new school. So like enough, some people are able to give me some like computers, one laptop a child, and they are able like to use this computers just to learn, to learn some basic ideas of how computer works, rather than learning it at a real old age like I did. <clears throat> so when I graduated from the um, African Leadership Academy, I applied to Dartmouth College, where I am right now. I'm a, I'm a junior. I'll be graduating next year. So they have been like studying a I'm studying environmental studies and also some engineering. I'm hoping that at the end, I'll be able to go back to Malawi to see how I can be able to use the knowledge that I'm getting from my classes to solve some of the problems that people are facing in my community and other areas in Malawi in general. So that's uh, one thing that I'm doing. So every summer, I try to go back to Malawi to work on different projects. Last summer, I went to Malawi with one of my friends from Dartmouth who were installing solar panels at the high school. Uh, the high school that kicked me out uh, when my parents <laughs> couldn't pay for it. So we are able to install these solar panels. The idea is that because they don't have enough teachers, we are planning that to install these solar panels and we'll be able to use computers and projectors. We are hoping that we'll be able to record classes from other schools that they have all learning materials like they can have or do like some experiment or the laboratory materials. So we are trying to record those classes and then we'll put them in the uh, fresh drive and the student will be able to project those classes later on when they're having a supervisor to upperclassmen student who act as a supervisor just to address the problem that the students are facing. Uh, in that way. So last summer I was able to do that and this summer it will be more of like installing the local network that the student will be using. So one of the projects that, that I also did uh, last summer was this biogas project. This biogas project is a project that has a history on me. It's, I learned about biogas long time ago and I tried to do it 
but I failed. So I heard that you're going to be able to generate a biogas that you're going to be able to use for cooking if you have um, animal manure and put them in a, a chamber, wait for some days for heat to start building up and you're going to be able to generate a gas. I was like, it's simple enough, I'm going to do that. But I guess I wasn't too patient. When I heard all the story, I was like, what I need is heat, so it's easy to make a heat. I was like, okay, I'm just going to take, I took goat, uh, goat poop, I put them in one of my mom's best cooking pot. I was like, I'm going to boil it. So I end up boiling goat poop. But nothing happened. My mom, she was away at that time when I was doing it. And when she, comes, when she came back, she found me in the kitchen. And I was like refusing her to get in. I was like, no, 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 I'm busy, mom. Just like, go away. She was like, what are you cooking? <laughs> I was like, I'm cooking, uh, I'm cooking potatoes. They were, she, was, <laughs> she was like, potato doesn't smell like this. <laughs> Trust me, it was smelling so badly. So because of that, I wanted to, um, to go back after I ran some ideas and go back to rebuild it because they, there's lots of, a problem of like deforestation in my community. So I think by doing this, I think I can be able to address that problem. Um, as many women and girls, they spend a lot of time looking for firewood. They spend at least eight to 10 hours a week just looking for firewood, which is really like scarcity in many areas. So I'm trying to address that problem by using some waste uh, material that they are, biodegradable material that they are locally available, like cow, cow manure. Many, some people have cows, some they have chickens, they can be able to use that. So I'm trying to see how I can use that idea to solve, to address that problem. So when I went there last summer, I was able to do it. So, so far, at some point, it was able like, to generate some gas, but I haven't been able like to connect to everything, to be able to connect to the kitchen and uh, do all kind of stuff that they're going to be able to do. But I know that it's it going to be able to work and it's working. So when I go back this summer, I'll be able to do all this stuff to connect and uh, make sure that they are starting using it. So that's uh, some stuff that I've been like doing. So for me, when I look back, from the time that I started my project to the time to where I am right now, I faced so many challenges along the way. But one thing that encouraged me and helped me is that all those challenges that I was facing, when I look at it, they were there not to stop me from achieving my goals, but they were there to strengthen me from what I want to do. What I believe is that everything in Everything is possible if you trust yourself and if you believe in yourself. For sure, anything that you're going to do in life, you're going to face some challenges, but those challenges shouldn't stop you from doing what you want to do because everything is possible. All those people that are successful today, if you can ask them, at some point, they faced some challenges, but they didn't allow those challenges to stop them to do what they wanted to do. Sometimes the challenge that I can face is going to be different from your challenges, totally different. My challenge might, your challenge might look like small, but challenge is challenge. If you just like allow that challenge to take away your dreams, then you cannot um, achieve it. So I think for me, what helped me is like I really like trusted myself and I believe on what I was doing that I can do it if other people have done it then there was nothing that could have stopped me from doing the same thing. And sometimes in life, life is full of difficult decisions to make. I think one thing that helped me is like more, to more of like choose something that I really love doing and that I enjoy doing. That's really like helped me to, do, to overcome some of the challenges that I was facing when I was doing all, all of my, my project. 
So uh, this morning, I'll just say, like to thank you again for allowing me to share my story with you uh, this morning. It's a really great honor for me to be here. Thank you.